maximum breaths in your uh, practice of breathing so that just like any other when you're doing exercises for health you, you always do them all the way and the same thing it's the follow through like playing golf the golf swing or the bowling ball the follow through and breathing is like bowing frog and tip now for playing i recommend always in the positive curves rather than the negative curves of pulmonary function, which you already know about, but we haven't gone into for these folks. So it's like a gas tank on a car. I recommend always uh, that you're mostly somewhat above the half full um, if you're not using a lot of air. Or you can <coughs> considerably above half full if you have big heroic playing to do. But I would stay away from a quarter full tank, very much. I would not do much playing in that range. There are factors that will go into it, the whys of it and wherefores, but it gets hard to get the air out of the lungs. My name is Marcia Kaufman, and I used to be principal trumpet in Stockholm and also in the Munich Philharmonic Orchestras. Now I'm freelancing in Chicago, and I had an opportunity to take some lessons with Mr. Jacob uh, this past year. And I was at his master class last summer at Northwestern, and he gave us some specific exercises for increasing our uh, lung capacity. And I wish he could elaborate on those now. It's difficult to do under these conditions, you know, because I am not free to walk around and do the things that you would do, you know, or uh, involving physical exercise. But what they usually amount to would be to go into the psychology of respiration. Nobody can increase your lung capacity beyond what nature intended. But we try to bring you up to what your potential is. Marsha is a marvelous trumpet player and a wonderful piccolo trumpet player. All I try to do with somebody like this is get your potentials working for you. In other words, if there is a minimizing process that's put in somewhere based on concept, we try to alter that a bit in your favor. Now the exercises are to be done away from music to establish normalcy as a person. And we do this by teaching inhalation and exhalation. There are simple studies. You can take anybody and have them blow their breath out until they're as empty as they can achieve, in other words, and then wait with empty lungs until a need for respiration occurs. In other words, when they're turning blue and uh, beginning to suffer, then you take a huge yawn. That breath, after having denied yourself of um, respiration for 20, 30 seconds is going to be enormous compared to your musical breath. If you think instruments, you won't do it. But by creating an, a need for oxygen, a debt, you might say, then the conditions of the enormous yawn, which immediately brings you into a different mental state, you will find then what you could take under the abnormal conditions that I'm describing. Then you know, all right, there is a potential for this and then you can begin to work. You can make simple bags out of paper, plastic, and so forth, and blow them up like a balloon. You want something without resistance, but will trap your air. And then you can pour water in the bag and find out what it measures, and then use air instead. They're not exact measurements, but you're gonna have approximations develop. And with a young lady like yourself, you figure you're gonna start at three or four liters, maybe a four liter bag, a five liter bag. You don't have to fill it, fill it up all the way. But there should be a method of taking bowing and going from frog to tip. If you think of your air, like you would the movement of bow, the ability, the fuel supply of playing, then you have the way of doing it. By taking a bag, you're rebreathing your own air, which means you can go for 10 or 15 seconds without hyperventilation. You would then have hypoventilation. If you go too long, you'd be dead. <laughs> but uh, hopefully you won't exceed 15 or 20 seconds. It's like holding your breath for 15 or 20 seconds. You introduce tubing into the mouth. Take a piece of tube, three inches long and three quarters of an inch in diameter, and practice yawning through it. Find out how freely you can fill the lungs, how weak you can be, because the effort to take negative air pressure in is measured in very, very low pressures. In other words, 
If you take your arm and do this, the energy of using your arm this way should be translated into the abdominal functions and don't increase it beyond that and still go to full and empty lungs. There'll be slight differences. Don't hold me to the exact uh, innervation in the mouth. But nevertheless, you learn to take large volume movements of air as a civilian and spend time where this becomes a skill. Then you take some of these large breaths and you simply play on the mouthpiece without the trumpet. And uh, even there, waste the breath. Don't try to save it. it. It's free. It don't cost anything. But you make good music with it. And then you, when you replace it, you use sense of sight, a mirror. And you find, do you look like this? When I have my male students come in, usually they're using only abdominal breathing. So I tell them, oh, you've got to look like Dolly Parton. In other <laughs> words, uh, I need the upper chest as well. There is no such thing as a complete breath without the thoracic region being involved. This singer that came to me the other day says, why, you're moving your shoulders. Of course, you, you can't take a full breath without moving your shoulders. It doesn't exist. In nature, in a sense, I'm talking about true capacity breath. I'm not saying it's desirable to do this when you're playing your instrument, but if you want to find the follow-through phenomena, then you must fill and empty your lungs. You don't worry about whether you move your shoulders or whether you do this or that. You take as much air as you can and you blow air out. The physical skill develops. You don't start with skill. You must allow crudities at the first stage. And you practice increasing ease in the movements of large volumes of air. Then you practice the same ease in taking it in after playing a phrase on your instrument so that it's a one-way street. The efforts are outward, not inward. <gasps> Whatever it is. <gasps> Always in is easy. Out will be where the challenge of the resistances of function will be. And uh, there's a, can I go on with this? There's a study called neural inhibition. In other words, in a neurological sense, when you have a positive direction of motion in your mus musculatures in any one direction, if you suddenly reverse, you will have innervation in the reversal muscle. If you're going in extension fast and you have to go into flexion, you will have innervation of the extensors of the arm, but when you reverse, you will have innervation of the muscles that will flex the arm. But you also have de-innervation of even muscle tone in the extensor. In other words, if you don't surprise yourself, if you're blowing out and then you have to breathe in, you can take a tremendous breath. If you're still blowing out and you breathe in, you will have a gasp, but you will not have much air. But if you reverse the priority, when you breathe in, you are not blowing. You are sucking air up here, not working muscles down here. In other words, by taking air in here, the brain will immediately deactivate the antagonisms. They disappear so fast, believe me, it cannot be learned readily while you're playing your instrument. It should be learned away from your instrument and then transferred back, whether it's a student or the player. <laughs>